and I'm excited to jump into the word with you guys. You guys ready? All right. Hey, we're jumping into our third week of Lost, and I'm excited to be here and just share the word with you guys. Uh, Lost virtues, right? We've been talking about this week in and week out for the last three weeks, and these are things that we think maybe are just heavy burdens on our shoulders, but man, have they been life-giving. We've been talking about them in circles. We've been talking about them just in conversation. And what we're really starting to discover is that really these are the things that life was always, they were designed to be this way. These are the things that he's commanded us to do because this is the way we were originally supposed to be. That's what I'm finding. I don't know how you guys have been looking at it, but this is really the things that give us life. I was practicing my message yesterday, and sometimes, I don't know if you guys feel like this when you get nervous. Do you feel like you can't get a breath in? Like, you're just like, Yvette said, you sound like you're running up a hill. What are you doing? And I think that's what we do when we forget his lost virtues, these lost commandments, the things that he's given us. We just don't take a full breath. So I'm ready to take a breath with you guys this morning, and I'm ready to jump in here. Have we lost, right? Have we lost his commands? Have we lost our way, really? Have we lost our way or as he's, as we have lost his commands? And that is so key. You know, Yvette and I, we, we try to read our Bibles regularly together, and sometimes we forget to read our Bible. We forget to read what it even says. So if we can't be reminding ourselves by just reading his word, I would encourage you, open this up. If you don't have it, one of these, please get one. You won't know how to find your way if you don't have one. And yet still, even those of us that walk the journey, we lose our way sometimes, right? We feel that. And it says in John chapter 10, verse 27, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Yeah, we all talk about we don't like to be sheep, but guess what? We all have sheep tendencies. We can't deny it. Sometimes we fall over and we can't get ourselves back up, just like a sheep. I feel that all the time. And, and we still, we forget the voice, right? We forget his voice as shepherd. You know what's really powerful about this verse, actually, what spoke to me was that he's not making it seem like we're stupid sheep. He's actually just saying, hey, like, I'm putting you in a place where I can protect you, right? It goes on here. It says, through listening and obeying to Christ, we show, or through listening and obeying to Christ, we show our love for him, right? I was thinking of this this uh, a couple days ago as well. We show our love for him by just listening to his commandments. It's like a good father. When my dad gives me good instruction, I listen to it, right? I honor him with that. And that's the deepest love that I can show him. It says in 1 John, this is, uh, this is love for God, right? To keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. How often have you guys felt like maybe when you read the word and you open it up and you see something that it tells you to do, it tastes like bad medicine. Sometimes it tastes like bad medicine, but guess what? When you practice it over and over and over, it actually starts to taste pretty good. And so that's what it means when it says it's not burdensome. We start to have a connection with him instead of having this just uh, vague commandment, this vague thing that we have to obey. And yet when we start to form a connection with him and practice that relationship with him, it becomes like good, healthy food for our souls, right? His commandments are not burdensome, right? His commandments give us life. Take a breath. Everybody say, take a breath. Take a breath this morning. I, th I think even what we were talking about, just water. We need the things that just sustain us, and yet we just, we don't drink it. We don't breathe it in. First John chapter 2, it says this. I love this book, right? It says so many things, so many powerful things about this. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. We, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. That feels like a tall order. I don't know if I can live like Jesus. Come on, Judd. Let's be real. I don't know if I can live like him every day of my life. But it's, we've been talking again in, in groups and, and just in conversation. We all are like, man, it is a process. I can see. I can look back and see where I came from even a year ago as I practice these things. And my life is more like Christ today than it was last year. And if it's not, I want to encourage you that he has so much mercy for you. He's had so much mercy on my life. So he's ready to meet you where you're at this morning. 
Jesus shared these commandments, directions, and virtues with us. We need to find them and live like him. So we need to dig into here. We need to know what it says. And we actually need to be able to recall it to memory. Yes, will the Holy Spirit use you and actually remind you of those things? Yes, but I, I love the Forgotten Promises series because I just think of it all the time. You have to read it to know it, right? So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. We're going to go ahead and open the book. If you got your book, please, please get it out. We love bringing our Bibles because there's something different about having pages. You're not distracted. You're really, you know, there's something physical in front of you. So we're going to read the word here. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we're, we are members of one another. Man, somebody say, be honest. So, you know, what's interesting about this is that uh, it implies that we actually were not telling the truth in the first place, right? I think that sometimes we skim over this and think, well, of course, I'm a, I'm a believer. I, I, I don't lie. I, I'm, a good, I'm a good Christian. I maybe even grew up in a good home or, or maybe I, I changed my life for him. I don't, I don't lie anymore. But let me tell you, when I read this week, we're going to be talking about honesty this week and his virtue of of, of the truth, right? He's the, the author of truth. And sometimes I don't realize how easy it is for me to lie. Sometimes it's so, honesty comes dif- to be difficult. And the things that come with that can really be destructive. Wow. So I put this, and I wanted you guys to write this down. If you take notes, please bring out your note cards. Got them on the back of the chairs. Please write this down. But it says, honesty and deception cannot come out of the same mouth, right? For one leads to unity and one leads to separation. Again, I think we're all sitting here, Chad, I don't lie. I don't, I tell the truth. Come on now. Let me tell you what, I was in high school. I was homeschooled. Who's, who's, anybody in here homeschooled? Okay, just me, cool. Um, I'm the odd one out. Leah, I know you're, where, where's Leah? Okay, never mind. That's okay, she can hear me. Um, I decided it was a good idea to cheat on my language homework, right? And you know the number one mistake that I made? I got 100% on the test. Rookie mistake, right? And I say that lightheartedly, but we all can realize that we've done things over our past, right? But let's get real now. By the way, my mom caught me. I got in trouble. But the next time I did it, I didn't get every single one of them right. I I learned. But isn't that interesting how I learned how to just be a little bit different? I did it differently just to get by. I still do that today. Can I be honest? I'll be like, oh, like, honey, you can, you can just go upstairs, wash your face, go to bed. I'll take care of the dishes. Meanwhile, I'm in the kitchen grabbing a snack. And she says, what is on your breath? And I say that kind of lightheartedly, but it shows where my heart is. I'm like, why couldn't I just tell her I wanted a snack? Well, because I told she would tell me no. She, knew, she wants me to be healthy. I say that jokingly too, but even things like money. We lie to each other, about, to our friends or our spouses about money. I remember there was tax documents I had to send out one year. And it was actually just last year. I say one year. It was like just yesterday. And it, I, I still try to seem honest here, and I'm not, okay? But I said, oh, yeah. She's like, did you send those tax documents out? I said, oh, yeah, I got it. I sent that out. A couple days later, she reaches on the coffee. What's this? What's this, right? And I said, you know, it was interesting because there was really no consequences for me to tell her the truth. I hadn't missed a deadline, but I just wanted to be like, I got it covered. Don't you worry. I've got everything covered. We're good. And the consequences of that were not necessarily I had to pay penalties or anything like that. It was deeper than that. I actually hurt her, and she had to now keep tabs on me of whether I was doing the right thing with my finances, with our finances. And I thought I was protecting her. And how often do we do that? We tell each other, ah, I don't think this is the right church for me. You know, I think, you know, just you're, you're, you're not speaking to me. I can't be honest with you about how you offended me and how I'm not coming back. Or maybe it's a family member. And we're not willing to think and pray on how we should answer them. Instead, we just say, you know what? I just don't think we can have family get-togethers anymore. I can't be honest with you about how I'm feeling. 
Or we just tell each other blatant lies, right? We just lie and say, hey, you know, um, just feeling sick. I can't make it tonight. When you could just say, you know what? What you said last week offended me. I don't want to come to small group. Or maybe I don't like the culture of church. I'm trying to bring these things back to, because if we're supposed to be unified as a body, you start to see the little things that trickle in, even by not telling the truth. You don't even have to say a lie. You can just withhold the truth, and it divides us, right? And 1 John, oh, this is a tough one. Who is a liar? 1 John chapter 2. Who is a liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist. I don't know. I've never denied Jesus. That seems a little intense. But may I say this? I wrote this down. When we are deceptive with others, we misrepresent God. So if we're supposed to be reflections of him, like we've been talking about, we're supposed to be the image bearers of Jesus, and we're supposed to be unified as one body. As soon as we start to lie, we actually misrepresent him. We deny his true character. Bummer. (laughs) We are made to be a direct reflection of Christ. That is where you find true life. That's what we've been talking about. And I think if we really need to get down to this, we need to, if lying is such a difficult thing to identify, which I think now that we're thinking through, maybe the things we've said this week, I know I've said things this week that maybe weren't completely true. Lying, right? I wanted to define this for us because sometimes it's hard to, to know what it looks like. Any communicative act, any, doesn't have to be with words, right? That aims to cause receivers of the communication to adopt or persist in what? A false belief. Wow. So any false belief somebody can believe about you or about the situation, I'm actually being dishonest. Don't worry, we're going to get to the good part of soon. Soon, I promise. But we have to know what it looks like. We have to know the nature we're trying to shake off, the things that we're trying to put off the old self daily, right? It says in Proverbs chapter 26, or 28, verse 13, Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Man, so even if I conceal my sin from a brother or sister, if I don't confess, right, if I don't come clean, I can't, I can't be, you want to be successful? You want to stop feeling like trash every week? You want to stop having that sick feeling in your stomach? Just be honest. I'm speaking from experience. I'm not trying to come down on you guys. I'm speaking from experience in my current day, right? I do this all the time. I wrote this down as well. Honesty requires us to live, right? It requires us to live out the truth in action and word. Dishonesty comes through action, word, and even inaction, right? It says this in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. It says, but I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word that they have spoken. Somebody say empty word. That empty word means idle. It means almost like if I didn't say anything. So we don't have to say so much with our words directly, and we can still be off course. We can still be divisive and cause destruction. We can, I don't want to preach the end of the message before I get there, but if we're tired of not seeing things happen the way we envision them in church or in our life, right, then we have to start being truthful, right, with one another. And it goes on here. I wrote this down. This is the power in being honest. Somebody, this is the power. Yeah, and being honest, there are consequences for being deceptive with our words and actions. When I say the power in being honest, it's the most unifying thing that we could possibly do. It's how we start our relationship with him, right? We confess, yeah? So we have convinced ourselves that the act will actually bear good fruit. Have we convinced ourselves that this act will actually bear good fruit? Why is it powerful, Judd? Why is this honesty important to us? I know why it's not good. But why is it powerful? Are we actually convinced that we will bear good fruit if we're honest with one another and with him? I want you to ask yourself that this morning. Is this actually worth it? Or can I maybe just get away with the small things? Does it really matter? Does it add up to anything? Or are you just trying to tell me something that's just going to be a weight on my back? Yeah? I wanted to jump into the word this morning again. We're going to go to Genesis. First book, first book, guys. Turn to Genesis. We're going to go to... um, I believe it is, if you to get there, chapter two, no, chapter three. Okay. 
Very beginning. Okay. So I want to start off in a story we're all familiar with, maybe where deception, deception all began, right? Deception started way back in the garden and with Adam and Eve. We remember this story, right? Sunday school. What? The serpent, he comes along. What does he do? Let's read. Now, the serpent was more crafty. You can go ahead and put this up there. Now, the serpent was more crafty than all the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to woman, wait, 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 okay. Let's just back up here. He said to woman, a snake is talking, number one. And, and Eve actually listens, okay? You think, Eve, what are you doing? You're, you're listening to an animal speak and let alone a snake, okay? We often trust untrustworthy people. And even our own voice inside of our head, right? So sometimes we look at this story and think, Eve, you are crazy. You couldn't be listening to a snake tell you the truth, right? But don't we do the same? Don't I do the same? I justify it in my mind somehow that somebody that's given me counsel or or wisdom on how to lie and be deceptive, or I tell myself things, and yet we do the same. So it goes on here. Did God really say? Did God really say? So the next thing that she actually says here, we'll we'll get to it, but the next thing that she says in response is interesting, but I wanted to kind of stop here because this is how we also kind of start the deception of the lie. We don't necessarily say these words. We don't say, did God really say? But that's how we question it with our actions, right? We question with our actions and with our uh, demeanor or the way that we perceive things or the way that we allow others to perceive ourselves we, we really convince ourselves that did God really command me to be this way, right? A lie is built from questioning the word of God. The serpent started laying the foundation, right? So right here, he's starting the foundation of how he is going to be deceptive with her. It goes on. He says, you must not eat from any tree in the garden. Did God say that? No, he did not. If you go back to chapter 2, he didn't say that. So the serpent is speaking in a misleading, unclear manner. You can go ahead and put this up there. He's speaking in an, a misleading and unclear manner, absent of details to cause doubt, right? So I want to think about this for a minute. Again, this is what we do when we don't know the word of God clearly and the things that he's commanded us to do. Eve had no idea what was happening at this point. He said, does any tree? And she said, oh, look at this. This is what we do too. It goes on. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. So she says, no, it's not any tree. It is a specific tree. I'm going to tell you what he told me, but I'm going to get, I'm going to take it a step forward that he told me not even to touch it. He didn't say that, right? He didn't say that either. So sometimes we respond to others and we say, I know the truth. I'm going to stand on it right now. And yet we take it a step further further, and we open a window for him, right? Look what it goes on. I put, wrote this down. Eve added in detail to make what God said more extreme. Legalism is a lie and only allows for an open window for the enemy. And that's what we see start to happen in this story. So we'll see later on as we're talking about the Pharisees. The Pharisees are the ones that were addressed the most when he said, you guys are your father, the devil. Because we get so legalistic, we think that's what saves us. And what we end up doing is we allow a window in for deception and lies. And when we do that, we become a part of that. It goes on here. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Speaking to the very heart of man, right? Twisting it. Not that we should desire to be like him. We want to be like Christ. But no, you're going to be like God. You are going to be a God, right? That's what he's speaking to. He's wetting their appetite to be something better than what they should be. The serpent was telling Eve what she wanted to hear. How often do we tell ourselves what we want to hear, right? When I was telling, (laughs) I sometimes tell the truth. I tell her to go upstairs and say, you know, you go to bed and I'll clean up and that's what I do. And then other times I grab a snack like I told you guys. So sometimes I kind of tell myself what I want. I'm, I'm doing a good thing, right? 
I tell a lie and a good, has anybody ever said that? There's some lies that are good for people. Yeah, sometimes I protect their feelings. That's a good lie. We all have an appetite for what sounds good. We just do. What's comfortable? That's, that's the thing that I find myself. How, how often do you find yourself just flip it, flippantly just saying things like, oh, yeah, I caught a big fish. <laughs> right? And that it could have been the smallest little minnow. Or I can throw an 85-mile-an-hour fastball. Meanwhile, I'm a, I, I might have been able to throw 72 or 68. 45, right? I know, Jason's calling me out. But seriously, that's how we, it just comes off what sounds good to us. It goes on, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, oh, look, oh, yeah, you're right. It is good, devil. And also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Man, didn't he know too not to eat it? Didn't he know not to say anything? And yet, what did we say earlier? By omission, we can just say nothing and we make others fall with us. Isn't that crazy how this works? So sometimes we say, oh, Eve, she listened to the serpent. She did it. She was the one that gave him the fruit. And yet the most powerful thing in this story to me sometimes is that we just sit there and we say nothing and we allow others to walk into a situation or we allow others to go down a path we don't want them to go down, but we just do it anyway because it's easier. Yeah. Adam knew the reason they shouldn't eat it, and so did Eve. They both found reasonings to overlook the truth, right? Constantly I find myself reasons to overlook the truth, to not say what I know will help others, will edify others because it's not easy. Guess what? Because it's not a part of our nature to be honest, it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be uncomfortable, but the more that we practice it, the more it becomes life-giving. It is going to taste bad at first. This is probably one of the most difficult virtues. The first time you do it, it's going to taste bad, and it's going to hurt somebody probably when you have to tell the truth. It goes on in Genesis here, um, wrapping up the scriptures here in Genesis, but then the eyes of both of them were opened. And they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So Adam and Eve, they knew they made a mistake and wanted to cover up. (laughs) Right? How often do we do that? We can always recognize this honesty. We start to cover up a situation. So if you're saying, Judd, I still don't think anything you've listed today has really been on my heart and my mind. I just feel pretty good about this area. Can I say, how often do you do this when your phone's sitting out? Do you flip it over so no one can see what comes through? I don't know, just a simple little thing. Do I cover up my tracks in that way? Or do I turn my phone on silent so that I don't get the message? That's dishonest, right? Covering my tracks. I didn't get your call. I couldn't answer you, right? I'm just speaking of things that I've done in the past, right? Like I can say, like, I don't know. I I, I wasn't able to answer the call. Other things might be different for you, right? I cover my tracks by taking a mint before I go up, go up to bed so she doesn't know I had that snack. I'm just, I'm just being honest. And so I think each of you guys are knowing in your minds what, what you're finding and, and what's hitting you in the heart that we've all been there, right? And we all practice things and you're thinking, wow, this is heavy. And it should be, and that's okay. But I do want to give you hope. The, the, the devil is father, the father of dishonesty, right? He's the father of dishonesty and deception. We all have laid claim to that legacy. We all have. But I want to shake that off. Let somebody say, shake it off today. Yeah, let's get rid of it today. It says in John chapter 8, 44, or chapter 8, verse 44, you belong to the father of the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He's speaking to the Pharisees here. He was a murderer from the beginning and not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks. What does he speak in? His native language, for he is a liar and the father of all lies. Right? So he laid the foundation. He started it all. Stupid devil. But guess what? We can blame Adam and Eve too, but we lay claim to it every day. Every week of our lives, we've laid claim to it in some way. 
Dishonesty and deception, right? Started with the devil. If we practice dishonesty, then we are falling for his tactics. We are falling for his tactics. And I think this is something, again, I, the reason why I bring it up and the reason why it's on my heart is I see it so often in church culture. And, and I think it's interesting that we actually cover up the most as religious folks. We cover up the most, and, and it's the hardest for us to be honest for some reason. We get so stuck in our rules that, and our laws and our de- good deeds that it will save us, and yet we realize that we can't make it. We can't really cover it all, and so then we just cover it up. That's what happens. I want to encourage you, though. John 8, chapter, chapter 8, verse 45, it goes on. Yet because I tell the truth, Jesus tells the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? Wow, he's proving that he's telling the truth. He's the only one that can say that. If I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says, like a sheep, right? You want to be sheep today? Now you want to be a sheep, don't you? (laughs) The reason you do not hear is what you do not belong to God. I want to hear today. I want to hear what he has to say to me. I want to hear the truth. The only way we can know the truth The only way we can know the truth is know honesty and speak what is true is to know God, to know him this morning, right? It says in John 1, 1, what does it say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the most encouraging thing to me because honesty was established before the beginning of time. Truth was established before the enemy had a chance to come in and be dishonest. So guess what? Even though it's in my nature to be dishonest, I'm going to give you hope here, I promise. Even though it's in my nature to be dishonest with myself and with others, and especially with him, he established truth before that ever came. So even though it's in my nature, it's, I can't hardly shake it off. It really does come down to the fact that my true self is to be true. And and what I mean by that is we find ourselves, when we are honest, we actually start to find life. We start to take a breath. The weight starts to lift off your shoulder. That that pit in your stomach starts to lift, right? John chapter 18, verse 37 says, you are the king then. This is Jesus. He's coming before Pilate. You remember this. As he's coming before Pilate to give himself up, to die on the cross, Jesus answered and said, You say that I am king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to what? To the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Man, there's a pattern here. I have to listen to what he has to say to know the truth. You don't know it on your own. So if you're sitting in here today and you've never felt like you've known the truth. Now, it's interesting because we we may not be able to say, oh, well, I know what's true, but do we practice what is true regularly? We cannot practice what is true regularly without him. We can know the truth with Christ, right? Before we could not practice the truth without him. And it says this, uh, well, I'll, I'll get to that scripture, but again, practice is the key here. We may have not known that Jesus before, right? And so then before we knew him, we thought we knew the truth. And yet our eyes are now open and we can see things. We can feel things. We can hear other people around us and know that we're not speaking the truth sometimes. We're not being honest. The enemy left us hopeless with deception and destruction. Jesus came to bring truth that brings life, right? How many of you guys want life this morning? How many of you guys want life this morning? You feeling feeling empty like... Again, we were talking about the living water. You feel like you need filled up this morning. And this is an area of my life. If I was being transparent, this is an area of my life that I consistently have to come back to and say, this is probably why I'm not feeling filled up. This is probably why I'm not feeling connected with you guys at times. It's not necessarily telling, again, that bold-faced lie to you. But it's just not being transparent with you. It's not being honest with you guys right? It says in Romans chapter 10, this is a verse that we forget, right? Maybe you heard it when you first believed, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim, because if you confess with your mouth, everyone say confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Doesn't that sound like life? Doesn't that sound like life? Truth only comes because what? 
Truth only comes from both parties being brought about by restoration from a separated relationship. So Jesus, who is the truth, is the way, is the foundation before Satan ever had a chance to come in and teach you a different way. He was the truth from the very beginning, right? If we are truthful with him, the, the author of truth, we find restoration. And we need to confess regularly. We need to repent regularly. We need to find him in, in these moments when we're feeling like, I don't know how to be honest. I don't know how to do it. That's where we start. Through truth, we have unity with Christ. And with Christ, we also means with you guys. That means with you guys as the church, as the body. So I wanted to talk a little bit more maybe about why are we dishonest? I think that's what comes to my mind. Why are we dishonest with one another? Why are we dishonest with him? My first thought is avoiding hurt, right? We just don't want to hurt one another. Why would we want to do that? It says in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 18, it says, the one, who walk, the one whose walk is blameless is kept safe, but the one whose ways are perverse will fall into the pit. Wow. Your ways will be kept safe if you're honest, right? But we don't want to be honest. So we actually end up hurting one another. And and though we wanted to avoid it in the first place. Often we find that. We also want to preserve peace and unity, right? We want to preserve peace. We want to be unified. It says here in the next verse I put up here, uh, this is a story you may have heard, might have heard in Genesis chapter 12. It talks about Abram and Sarai. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe, and he was about to enter Egypt, and he said to his wife Sarai. You know, it's interesting. This is an intense moment, right? When things get intense in life, this is when we find that we revert back to our old ways. I know what a beautiful woman you are. Oh, what a compliment. Uh, <laughs> when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but I, but will let you live. How sacrificial of him. He's already saying, I want you to live. I'll die for you. Say you are my sister so that I will be treated well for your sake. And my life will be spared because of you. Oh, he's not being unselfish. He's actually being selfish. He wants his life to be spared. It goes on. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was a very beautiful woman. And Pharaoh's officials saw her. They praised her to Pharaoh and says, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake, and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. Wow. We, again, wanted peace and unity. We didn't want to hurt. So Pharaoh summoned Abram and says, What have you done to me? He said, Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Again, when we tell, the, tell something that's dishonest or a lie or we withhold the truth, we don't end up hurt, hurting ourselves so much in the moment. We end up actually inflicting pain and, and deception and actually dis, uh, separation on others. That's what ends up happening, right? Abram wasn't necessarily affected right away. Pharaoh was. Why did you say this? She is my sister. So that I took her to be my wife. Now then, uh, here is your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything that he had. I also want to say that God will not move through a promise that you feel that's been put over your life if a lie or deception is in the way. I have found that to be true in my own life. Yes, he will not work and and bring a promise in your life that you believe he's put on your life. If you allow a lie to persist, if you allow deception to persist, the reason why he inflicted pain on Pharaoh, in my opinion, for the first time I saw this, was because he was not going to bring Abram out of this land and preserve him and give him that generational blessing, right, where he'd have many generations after him, a great, more than the sands of the sea. He wasn't going to give him that promise through a lie or deception. So if you're feeling a block in the things that you felt like God has promised over your life, just evaluate, like, is, am I being honest with myself? Am I being honest with others? Am I, am I living in a way that's transparent? Am I omitting the, the truth? If you're feeling a block in the, in the, again, a step forward in the promises he's put over your life, this is where I would, I would ask myself this question. 
We often forget that our dishonesty hurts and offends others more than ourselves at first. But again, the promise won't necessarily come if we want to continue in that way, if we want to practice the ways of what his native tongue, the enemy. Three, I said edification of self. I want myself to look good. That's why I said I caught the big fish. That's why I said I threw 90 miles per hour. Oh, wait, it's rising. I'm getting faster. I can throw harder than I could before. But isn't that interesting, though? We do say it so easily. It comes off. Oh, there it is. I just, why did I say that? It says in Romans chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be anger and wrath. Self-seeking, edification of self. That's why we reject the truth every time. We think that that's for the unbeliever, but it's also for the believer to realize that. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil. To reject the truth is evil. It's of the enemy. First for the Jew and then for the Gentile. I love that because guess what? None of us are excluded. (laughs) That's what that means. We all have the same truth here in front of us. Number four, what? We get comfortable. This is another reason why we're dishonest. We just get comfortable. It becomes a pattern. It becomes something we can't quite shake because we have lived this way. And and this is a whole other message I could preach. But we live this way, maybe not just because of the legacy that Adam and Eve gave us, but maybe because our parents lived that way. So if I took a legacy of lying and being dishonest, maybe from my parents or maybe from Adam and Eve, don't you think that you could pass that down to your next generation? If we're not honest, we get comfortable and that comfortability gets passed down. Romans chapter 7, verse 15, it says, I do not understand what I do. Paul says, for I do what I do not want to do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, okay, Paul, what are you saying? I agree that the law is good as it is. It is no longer for myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I don't want sin to live in me any longer. I don't know how you guys feel. But sin is living, when something is living in me, I kind of want to keep it alive. It's comfortable. I'm ready to get rid of it. It says in Matthew chapter 12, I'm going to say this again, but I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. This is the most uncomfortable thing you could probably come across in Scripture, right? I have to give an account for every empty word, every word that I was deceptive and dishonest. Now, let me tell you this. I'm going to say this because I think that we can easily become legalistic like Eve and not let grace cover because, you know, his grace does cover the mistakes that we make. He does redeem. He redeems all things for those that love him. So even the things that you were dishonest with, he will still redeem that if you turn back, if you confess like Romans 10 said. If we confess and believe in our hearts and proclaim him as Savior, right? If we confess to one another as we should, as we make mistakes, he will cover that, right? But if we continue to practice this, doesn't this sound more uncomfortable in the end? might be more comfortable for a moment. These are the quince- the, there are quince- consequences for being deceptive with our words or with our actions. And we see that even now in the present, right? When we end up, the truth comes out and we didn't want it to. It's the most, ah, oh, it just feels like the most gut-wrenching feeling, right? Tell me something good, right? Benefits of being honest. <laughs> Let's end here. Benefits of being honest. Forgiveness and healing. Forgiveness and healing. It says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. All. You can live a perfect life. You can be holy as he is holy here on earth. If you're just honest, you don't have to be perfect. He just wants you to be honest. Number two, peace and unity. Kind of seems similar to the reasons why we were lying in the first place, right? Peace and unity. You can go ahead and put this up here. Yeah, it says in uh, Isaiah chapter 32, verse 17, the fruit of that righteousness, what? The righteousness we were given because why? Because we what? We confessed. The fruit of righteousness will be peace. I love this. And I think we all need to grab hold of this promise. Can you listen to this? It will, its effect will be quietness and what? And confidence forever. 
How often do I walk into a church and I don't see confidence? I don't see confidence sometimes. I don't feel confident sometimes. But if I'll grab hold to what he's promised to me, I will have confidence if I'm honest with you. Three, we get freedom. This is the best part, guys. Freedom. It says in Romans here, or I believe actually in John chapter 8. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed of him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. How often have we heard that saying, right? They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham, and we have never been enslaved to anyone. Well, the offspring of Abraham, we read about him. He's kind of a liar too. How is it that you say you will become free? It goes on, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices, there's that word again, Practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Again, I'm not asking anyone in this room to be perfect this morning. But if we, can we start being honest with one another? Can we stop being deceptive by omitting the facts? I don't, if I don't hear from you for, for 12 weeks, how can I know how you're feeling? How can I know, how can I leave and lift you up? And I don't mean this in a mean way, but we cannot be mind readers of one another, right? We have to be honest with one another. Somebody say bonus. I'm going to steal it from the pastor. Bonus. We want all the spiritual gifts, right? Of tongues, prophecies, all of those good things. Healing, the list goes on. But can the prophetic and deception come out of the same mouth? So if if we want a vibrant church, we're asking, Lord, we want you to heal. Lord, we want peace in this place. I want to feel your closeness. I want to feel how much you love me. But again, the Holy Spirit can't lie. God cannot lie. It says that in Hebrews 6. God cannot lie. It says in Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, I baptize you. Hey, we're doing baptisms today. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I. This is John the Baptist speaking, right? This is the baptism we're talking about. Whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit in fire. That fire makes me think it's going to burn up those things. But if I don't allow the fire to burn up those things and get rid of the old self, how can it take full effect? How can we expect the, the miraculous to happen? His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear the threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff will burn with unquenchable fire. Again, I go back to that verse that says, we have to give an answer for the words that we have spoken at the end. You don't have to be perfect, but don't practice. Don't stay in the pattern that you've stayed in before. And if you're hearing this message for the first time, this is not somebody that has to live in a church for 12 years and understand all the scriptures. It says to be baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. It goes back to Romans chapter 10, and you can put that up there, the Romans chapter 10. You can actually believe and be saved. It has nothing else to do with your, your efforts from here on out. It just requires you to be honest, to confess with everything that you've got. Just be honest. I need you in this place. Again, we get so comfortable and trapped up in the things that we've said over the, our, over the years. And sometimes it's hard to know the truth for ourselves. So if you're hearing this message for the first time, maybe, of, of receiving Christ, I want to encourage you, is the moment, is today the moment you want to be honest? And I say that for all of us in this room, of course. But is, is today the moment that you want to be honest with him and say, I don't even know the truth sometimes. Everybody tries to tell me what's true, but I know something, this Jesus, I know that he speaks truth, and I want to know more of him, right? Do you want to dedicate your life? Where you can get baptized today right? You can throw off the old self. You can experience the newness of life, like the things that you've been desiring, the things that you've been working hard for in your job, the things that you've been looking to, to others to fulfill in relationships. You can have that today, but you have to be honest with him. Somebody say, be honest. Again, I, I want to say to anyone who wants to receive him today, you can pray that prayer, and it, things will change if you mean it, right? Your life will continue to be difficult, but he will be with you through every part of it. Does anybody in this place want to make that decision?
And this is a really bold move. And I, I ask it not knowing everyone in this room well. Some of you I know really well. But do you want to make that decision today? Anybody in this place, you can raise your hand. It's a decision that you can, you can hold back, like Nick said. You can kind of stay where you're at. Or you can say, yeah, I do want to step forward. And I actually do want to make a decision for Christ. I do want to say yes to him. This is a scary moment. Maybe you've been thinking about this for months. I don't know. Does anybody want to make that decision in this place? Okay. All right. Well, hey, let's get ready for baptisms. I do want to pray. If you do want to pray that prayer in your heart right now, I'm going to pray with you. If you want to make that decision real, let's do it. God, I pray that you would just come into this place, that your spirit would fill this place, Lord. I pray for anyone in this room, if you want to accept him, if you want to have a life that's overflowing with joy, if you want to have a life that is closer to him again, I pray that you'd pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart that you are Lord and Savior. You came and died for me on the cross. I pray that you would come into my life, show me how to follow you with everything that I've got, that I would lay everything down for you. I pray that you would forgive me of everything that I've done wrong, Lord, and show me the truth, Lord. Help me to be honest with you. Help me to confess the things I don't understand. I believe in you, and I put everything in you, all my trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we lift up a shout of praise for those who made that decision?